Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Deborah Bogo Ernst, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. I am co-chair of the firm's Consumer Litigation and Class Actions Practice Group. And joining me today as a co-presenter is David Tallman. David is a partner in Mayor Brown's Houston office and is a member of the Consumer Financial Services Group. Before we begin, we have a few small housekeeping announcements. As we go along, we hope that you'll ask questions by using the Q&A panel at the right side of your screen. We hope to have time towards the end of the webinar to answer questions. If we are unable to answer questions during today's presentation, we will try to follow up with you if you'd like after the webinar has ended separately. And second, you'll be all happy to know we do have CLE credit for today's webinar. During the webinar this morning, we'll be providing an alphanumeric code. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. So don't worry, we'll repeat the code and say it a, a couple times for you all to take down. And uh, one last caveat before we start with the substance. The views that David and I express today are our own and should not be attributed to Mayor Brown or our clients specifically. So with that said, let's get started. Hopefully you all see up on your screen our title slide, Texas Home Equity Lending, A Brave New World. And we do believe that is the case in light of two recent Texas Supreme Court opinions. So today we would like to go over, first of all, some background for you on the Texas Constitution. Uh, I'm sure everybody has different levels of familiarity with the Constitution, so we'd like to kind of do some review for those of you who are very familiar with it and those of you who are joining with a limited background. We'll go over some of the provisions that were at issue in the two recent decisions. The two recent decisions issued in May of this year were Garofolo versus Aquin and Wood versus HSBC Bank. So we'll go over both of those cases by the Texas Supreme Court. And then we'll talk a little bit about the impact of the holdings in terms of statute of limitations going forward, the availability of forfeiture of principal and interest as a remedy for borrowers. That's a very harsh remedy for borrowers under the Texas Constitution, so let, we'll talk about that. And then UDAP risks. So what does this look like going forward for you? And then we'll turn over to future litigation implications potentially of these two rulings, as well as some practical considerations for you to think about as you move forward with Texas home equity lending. So first let's start with the Texas Constitution. I, the Texas Constitution section 50, homestead, the title is actually Protection from Forced Sale, Mortgages, Trustees, and Liens. And essentially, Section 50 is protecting the homestead from forced sale. This is particularly Section 50A. So it protects the homestead from forced sale for the payment of all debts with certain exceptions. And we'll talk about some of those exceptions here today. It also, the Texas Constitution also limits the types of loans that may be secured by a homestead lien. So in 1997, Texas had a constitutional amendment to permit homestead liens to secure home equity loans. And that's, you know, the subject of today's call. So starting on limitations of liens, liens on the homestead are only allowed under the Texas Constitution if, among other things, the loans are made on the condition that forfeiture of all principal and interest, that's all principal and interest, is available if the loan is constitutionally non-compliant and, this is a big and, the lender fails to cure within 60 days of notice from the borrower. Thus, you know, this provision on forfeiting all principal and interest is really only available if the lender fails to cure after receiving notice from the borrower within 60 days. We've listed the provision of the Constitution there. It's Section 50, A6, capital Q, small x. So, you know, really the intent was to encourage lenders to correct loan problems with the threat of this forfeiture penalty kind of in the background. So, and there, there are avenues available specifically under the Texas Constitution to correct the failure to comply, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. 
So we wanted to give you a few examples. I'm sure many of you on the phone are familiar with the way you have to lend under Texas law, under the Texas Constitution. So on this slide, we just give you a few of the examples. The, um, the rest you'll find in section 50A6. So we're focusing specifically today on an extension of credit that is of a principal amount that when added to the aggregate total of the outstanding principal balances of all other indebtedness secured by valid encumbrances of record against the homestead does not exceed 80% of the fair market value of the homestead on the date the extension of credit is made. This is section 6B. So really what they're saying there is when you're lending in Texas, you need to make sure that on the day you're lending, your indebtedness, the, the principal amount that you're lending is not more than 80% of the fair market value of the homestead when you consider all of the other liens. So if somebody has 100% of, of the value of the property already um, under a mortgage or other lien, you need to make sure you basically would already be in violation of this provision because nothing should exceed 80% of the fair market value. So you need to consider that. We've and, also and this is one of the. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead, David. I was going to say that this is one of the reasons it's credited as one of the reasons that the Texas property markets have, you know, held up through the financial crisis and the the downswing in property values that hit other states is that it is difficult to take out a significant amount of home equity in Texas because of the CLTV limit. Okay, that's a great point. And so then a couple other examples for you on this slide. You know, we need to make sure that the extension of credit doesn't have prepayment penalties, that's 6G there. And then this, this other one down here that we've listed on the slide under 6Q7, is the subject of one of the cases we're gonna talk about. So the extension of credit needs to be made on the condition that within a reasonable time after termination and full payment, the lender cancel and return the promissory note and give the owner in recordable form a release of the lien. So once somebody pays off, you gotta send them the copy of the release in recordable form. And we'll get to that in one of our cases. So the Texas Constitution also provides six specific ways to cure a problem with a loan. And so here we have them listed. They are under section 50A6, Q, X, A through F. So they're, they're very specific and they're gonna apply to specific issues with a loan. Clearly not, you can't fix all problems with, for example, this subpart A, which we've listed as one here, paying to the owner an amount equal to any overcharge paid by the owner under or related to the extension of credit. So that's gonna to apply to somebody who overpays on the loan. So one way to fix that, it, you know, if they, if they send you the notice, you get 60 days to cure this, you can provide them a payment of equal to the overcharge. Another one, way, to, oh, go ahead, David. One, one violation that this one would apply to, for example, is a violation of the 3% fee cap. So if the bar was charged more than 3% in fees, you could cure it by paying, uh, refunding the overcharge to the consumer. Uh, either before receiving notice or within 60 days of receiving notice. So then the second, way, oh sure, absolutely. The second way to cure is under B, sending the owner a written acknowledgement that the lien is valid only in the amount that the extension of credit does not exceed the percentage. And there basically in that subsection, they are referring to subparagraph B and H and I listed above. So basically taking a look at this, you need to give the borrower written notice that basically their, their lien is only valid in the amount that the extension does not exceed the percentage. And then the third way to cure here is sending the owner a written notice modifying any other amount, percentage, term, or other provision prohibited by you know, the language above to a permitted one and adjusting the account. So if you know that there's a percentage, a term, or an amount that's prohibited by the Texas Constitution, you adjust it and send them the borrower written notice. The fourth way to cure here is delivering the required documents to the borrower if the lender fails to comply or obtaining appropriate signatures. Again, this one is specific to some of the other provisions above. And then the fifth way to cure, sending the owner a written acknowledgement if the failure to comply is prohibited that the accrual of interest and all of the owner's obligations under the extension of credit are abated while any other prior lien prohibited remains secured by the homestead. And then the last one, which is subsection F number six on this slide, 
This is a catch-all provision for certain issues. As you'll see in some of the cases we discuss, it cannot correct everything. But this catch-all is if the failure to comply cannot be cured under one through five above. You cure the failure by a refund or credit of $1,000 and offering the owner the right to refinance at no cost on the same terms with any modifications necessary to comply. So this cure certainly would apply in certain instances, but for example, as we'll see in one of our cases, you know, if you're offering to refinance a paid off loan, that wouldn't make sense and this provision would not um, cure that problem. So let's get into the two recent cases by the Texas Supreme Court. The first one being Garofalo versus Aquin. It was a 7-2 decision by the Texas Supreme Court. And you know, here you have a plaintiff obtaining a home equity line of credit, and it was in the amount of 159,700. So this plaintiff obtains it in 2010, pays off the loan four years later, you know, the lender does the right thing and releases the lien um, within 27 days of payoff, which is great. Um, but the plaintiff did not receive the release of the lien in a recordable form as required by the Constitution and the loan agreement. So what does the plaintiff do? The plaintiff waits till, uh, the plaintiff notifies first the servicer and then gives them 60 days to provide the, the lease in recordable format and the servicer does not provide the document. So following that passage of 60 days, the plaintiff sues the servicer for purportedly violating the Texas Constitution and for breach of contract. And basically, what does the plaintiff want? He wants the lender to forfeit all principal and interest under both theories. So here you have somebody obtains a home equity line, pays it off, and now, you know, after these 60 days, they're trying to go after the servicer for all principal and interest under both theories. So the Texas Supreme Court looked at two questions. First, is there a constitutional right to forfeiture of principal and interest under these facts? And the second question is, is forfeiture available via a breach of contract claim under the facts of this case? And fortunately, the court answered no to both questions here. So the plaintiff's argument first was that, you know what, the failure to deliver and release the lien in recordable format equaled a, a violation of the Constitution, and they should have this remedy to forfeiture of principal and interest. And the court disagreed, and basically the court said, look, you know, the Constitution doesn't create, allow, or regulate home equity lending. Um, you know, so basically what we're focused on here, this provision in 50A is saying, you know, we're going to protect these homeowners from forced sales. And that's what the court really focused on here. The, the court looked at the list of compliant loan requirements, a few of which we discussed at the top of the hour, and they said, you know what, these are not constitutional rights by themselves. They only assume constitutional significance when their absence in a loan term is used as a shield from foreclosure. So if in this instance, you know, Aquin had sued the plaintiff in the foreclosure context, maybe that would be different. But what you have here is a plaintiff who paid off the loan. Aquin certainly was not seeking to foreclose in this instance. And so, you know, the plaintiff here should not be allowed to have forfeiture of principal and interest under those facts. From a constitutional standpoint, compliance is measured by the loan as it exists at origination. And so basically, the court said just as the terms and conditions in, in 50A6 are not constitutional rights unto themselves, nor is the forfeiture of principal and interest a constitutional remedy unto itself. It's just a term and condition on a home equity loan that, must be, that it must include to be foreclosure eligible. So basically what the court was saying is 50A is not gonna have applicability outside the context of a forced sale or foreclosure, and the Constitution does not address post-origination enforcement of loan provisions. After looking at the constitutional rights, the court turned to breach of contract and took a look at the loan agreement. And in this instance, the loan agreement incorporated the requirements of the Texas Constitution. It took a look at the requirement to deliver the release of the lien and the forfeiture remedy that were, was in this loan agreement. And the plaintiff acknowledged that she had not suffered any damages for failure to deliver the recordable release of lien. So the court said, basically, if a lender fails to meet its obligations under the loan, Forfeiture of principal and interest is an available remedy only if one of the six corrective measures can actually correct the problem and the 
vendor nonetheless fails to timely perform the relevant corrective measure. So here, you know, we looked at some of those six provisions to cure under the Texas Constitution, and none of them would cure this instance of sending the borrower the release of lien in recordable format. So the court found no breach of contract under these facts, and in addition, the plaintiff must show actual damages to maintain a breach of contract or seek some other remedy such as specific performance. So, you know, for example, if they sued to get the recordable release of lien, suing for specific performance. So the, the court did say that the borrower may seek a breach of contract claim when the constitutional forfeiture provision is incorporated into the loan, but forfeiture is only available if one of the six specific constitutional corrective measures would actually correct the lender's fail to comply with its obligations under the loan terms, and the lender fails to comply after notice from the borrower. And then we'll turn to the second Texas Supreme Court decision issued in May of this year. It's Wood versus HSBC, and here you have, in 2004, plaintiffs obtaining a $76,000 home equity loan and eight years later, the plaintiffs provided the note holder and servicer notice that the loan did not comply with the Texas Constitution in their view in several ways, including that closing fees exceeded 3% of the loan amount. So neither the note holder nor the servicer cured this alleged defect after the notice. So the borrower is then, and that's that 60-day notice provision we talked about earlier. So the borrower is then sued seeking to quiet title they also had claims for breach of contract, fraud, and declaratory judgment that the lien securing the home equity loan was void, that all principal and interest be forfeited, and that the borrowers have no further obligation to pay. So quite a few claims there. The trial court actually granted summary judgment to the lenders on all claims, and the Woods appealed, the plaintiffs appealed. And they did not appeal everything, though. They, they appealed the claims based on the constitution, alleged constitutional noncompliance. So they appealed the quiet title claim and the declaratory judgment claim seeking to forfeit all principal and interest paid. So the Wood Court took a look at plaintiff's uh, quiet title and the declaratory judgment claim. And first, the court held that the lien was void, not voidable because basically what the court said was a lien securing a constitutionally non-compliant home equity loan is not valid before the defect is cured. So here the plaintiffs were alleging that the closing fees exceeded 3% of the loan amount. The court had to accept that allegation as true for purposes of its analysis and basically found that if that is the case, if you have a constitutionally non-compliant loan, it is going to be void and therefore no statute of limitation applies to cut off a homeowner's right to quiet title to real property encumbered by an invalid lien. Because if the lien had been voidable, you'd have the four-year statute of limitations that would be applicable. And so here, as in this Wood case, as applied to plaintiffs, if the allegation that plaintiffs were charged closing fees exceeding 3% of their loan value was accurate, the lien on their homestead did not secure a debt described by the section, so a valid debt, and as such, a lien may not be valid. And of course, the, the lender's concern articulated in the briefing was that they'd be required to defend against constitutional noncompliance claims more than four years after closing. So it makes it very difficult to kind of think ahead and, and determine when you'd cut off your liability on claims like this. And the court responded and said, you know, lenders should be encouraged to cure constitutional noncompliance on their own, even without the 60-day notice from the borrower. So in the end, the court found no statute of limitations applied to the Woods Quiet Title Action, and it got remanded on that basis. Now, the good news out of the Wood decision is that it followed Garofolo in terms of the plaintiff's declaratory judgment action. So the plaintiffs did not appeal, as we said before, their breach of contract and fraud claims. They only appealed their quiet title action and declaratory judgment action. So the court used Garofolo and basically said Section 50A, remember as we talked about before, that was tied to protecting the homestead from forced sale, does not create substantive rights beyond a defense to a foreclosure action on a home equity lien securing constitutionally noncompliant loans. 
So foreclosure, again, is not a constitutional remedy. And in this instance, the plaintiff in Wood would not uh, have their declaratory judgment claim for forfeiture of principal and interest going forward. So the court affirmed on that claim it was not viable because it relied on the constitutional cause of action under 50A, which does not create a constitutional right of action. So basically the court said it has to be litigated as tied to the loan agreement. And I'm gonna turn it over to David to talk further about the impact of the Wood and Garofolo Holdings. Thanks, Deb. So in terms of you know, what this is going to mean for you know, lenders and purchasers of Texas home equity loans, the first big issue is obviously this fact of the statute of limitations, which lots of lower courts had previously held would apply to a claim to quiet title or void the lien, uh, no longer applies. Um, previously, courts had suggested, and um, most lower courts had held, that there'd be a four-year limitations period on, a, on such a claim. Because Wood is, has now held that a non-compliant Texas home equity loan. So if there's some sort of deficiency in the terms and conditions that, of the loan at origination, Wood held, holds that that voids the lien uh, ab initio, as in lawyer speak, from the beginning. And as a result of that, a borrower's claim to uh, quiet title isn't a claim to, to void something which, are, which already exists. It's merely seeking a declaratory judgment of about something, about a fact that, that is already extant, that the, asking the court just to confirm that this lien already is void. And the way that Texas limitations law works, that type of claim is not going to be subject to the default four-year limitations period that would apply to uh, a claim to actually void a, an otherwise valid lien or to bring a breach of contract claim or something like that. What this means is, is that if you have a portfolio of uh, vintage Texas home equity loans and there are defects, compliance defects in that portfolio, uh, the liens may be invalid. Uh, they are, were, were void when they were made, they continue to be void now. Uh, this is a problem because there's a lot of variation out there, uh, as some of you know, when you're looking at dated pools of Texas home equity loans. There are lots of forms of contracts, uh, some of which are better than others. Uh, when the Texas amendments to the Constitution were first passed in 1997, they became effective on January 1st, 1998. And you know, Texas banks were really very, very excited about these, these amendments. They were ready and raring to go to start making home equity loans. Then the, the, the joke is, is that you started seeing home equity security instruments that were written on the back of envelopes and placemats because, uh, you know, as soon as that starting gun went off, people started making home equity loans. And, you know, over time, it's been an iterative, iterative process. The documents have gotten much better as, you know, lenders have gotten more sophisticated and comfortable with the provisions of the Constitution, as courts have weighed in and, you know, clarified and elaborate, elaborated on some of the ambiguities. but. Uh, particularly for older vintages, there can be a lot of compliance problems. And as a result of the Woods holding, uh, if you have known compliance issues, that voids the lien. And the only way now that you can reinstate the lien is by curing. Uh, and you would do that by either before receiving notice of the violation from the, from the homeowner, from the consumer, or within 60 days of receiving notice. Uh, curing the violation under one uh, of those five, six cure mechanisms. The, but if you fail to do so, uh, the, loan, the, the lien continues to be void. Uh, Deb, next slide. The, the next issue is with this forfeiture remedy. Um, now, as Deb indicated, the, one of the requirements of the Texas Constitution says that in order for a Texas home equity lien to be valid, it has to be, quote, made on the condition that the lender will forfeit all principal and interest if uh, they fail to meet their obligations under Section 50A6 of the Texas Constitution and uh, fails to cure the, the violation. What that means is that um, 
if there's a violation we haven't cured, lender has to forfeit, may have to forfeit all principal and interest previously collected. Um, in the Garofalo holding, it, the court says that this really is not a constitu independent constitutional remedy. You don't have the borrower doesn't have a constitutional claim for forfeiture. They really only have a claim under the terms of the contract itself, saying, "Okay, a violation exists. It was curable. It was not cured. Therefore, you will forfeit principal and interest." That is helpful in that it limits the circumstances in which a borrower can bring a forfeiture claim. It really does have to be in the context of an action to uh, to enforce the the debt obligation or a foreclosing the lien. The borrower can't bring it as a standalone declaratory affirmative action saying, I, there, you have an obligation under the Constitution to forfeit principal and interest. It has to be more, more in the nature of a defensive claim. One thing which is important to keep in mind here is that there is a previous Texas Supreme Court case, uh, LaSalle Bank uh, v. White in 2007, which as a practical matter is often going to serve to limit the impact that the forfeiture uh, remedy is going to have on a, a lender or holder of a Texas home equity loan. Uh, as, as the court itself recognizes, uh, and as Deb mentioned earlier, uh, forfeiture is a draconian remedy, I, and, and the court realizes that, and it's taken some steps over the years to try to, to limit that draconian impact. One of which is this concept of equitable subrogation. What the court said in LaSalle in 2007 was that, sure, the borrower may be able to say, okay, under the terms of the home equity loan itself, the lender says that it will forfeit all principal and interest under this new home equity loan. However, as a matter of general fairness and equity, the court says, is that if the lender advanced funds under the home equity loan to repay prior debt that was secured by liens on the homestead. So if the home equity loan was, in addition to cash out, was refinancing other prior valid liens on the homestead, such as a purchase money lien, a home improvement lien, some other type of lien on the homestead which is authorized under the Texas Constitution. As a matter of general fairness and equity, the lender has a right to be paid back on the, on those, to, be, to be paid back on those funds which had advanced to pay off those prior liens. And so the court says that the lender or holder can, if, once the borrower obtains you know, forfeiture principal interest, can bring it, ask the court to recognize that there is an equitable debt and an equitable lien uh, securing amounts advanced to repay prior valid debt. What this means is that you know, once you go through all this rigmarole and, and make claims and cross claims, the end result is that the forfeiture penalty will only apply to the, the cash out portion of, of the transaction. Those po that portion of the principal and interest which we're owing on uh, refinanced debt, the lender will still have a right to and they still will have an enforceable lien to on, but they do have to ask the court first to create this, this equitable lien and equitable, equitable debt. So that, that's very helpful. That, that will limit the impact of the forfeiture remedy in those circumstances where it is available. Uh, next slide, please. And now here is the UDAP risk associated with the, these cases. And I think this is an unintended impact of, of these two holdings that the Supreme Court did not necessarily fully consider when it issued these decisions. So I'll, I'll walk you through how, how this UDAP risk arises. First, as we've said, the, the lien that secures a non-compliant home equity loan is void from the start rather than voidable. In addition, one of the conditions of uh, Section 50A6 is that in order for a home equity loan to be sec secured by a valid lien on the homestead, one of the things that it must do is it must say in the loan agreement that the borrower will not be personally liable for the debt. So in other words, there's no personal recourse against the debtor unless the debtor obtained the loan through actual fraud. In other words, the loan is only enforceable, the debt obligation is only enforceable against the property through foreclosure of the lien. There's no, in ordinary circumstances, absent evidence of actual fraud, 
there's no personal recourse. Now, obviously, curing a violation can validate the lien, uh, is what Wood said. But then, when you look at Garofalo, Garofalo says that uh, not all violations are curable. And I think the Texas Supreme Court thought it was being helpful when it said that in Garofalo because it was talking about uh, you know, curability in the context of a, a forfeiture remedy and saying that you know, forfeiture only is going to be available when you have a, a violation which is inherently curable and the lender fails to cure. And they're saying, well, in this case, when we've got the violation is the failure to uh, release the lien and deliver confirmation that the borrower, that's not really curable through any of the mechanisms. Therefore, forfeiture is not a valid remedy. That, that's helpful when you're talking about forfeiture. That's less helpful now when you're talking about uh, collectability and enforceability of the debt. Because if the lien is irredeemably void, so if you know that there, a violation of the Texas Constitution exists, and, I, and it can't be cured, either because Garofalo says this type of violation is inherently uncurable, or because uh, you, the borrower has given notice of a violation and the cure period has expired, well, now the lien is irredeemably void. And the debt only, since the debt only can be enforced against the property, now you've got a debt obligation which uh, is unforceable under state law. And under general UDAP principles, you know, unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices, uh, the CFPB and FTC uh, and some courts have held that it is a, an unfair practice to knowingly attempt to collect on a debt which you know to be unenforceable under state law. The classic example of this is time bar debt. If you've got a debt which is a you know, there's a debt obligation out there, but it can't be enforced because the statute of limitations period has run. CFPB has said in uh, various friend of the court briefs uh, that it's a UDAP to try to collect on this debt because you're trying to encourage the borrower to pay on an obligation which can't be enforced against them. Well, similarly here, if you have a, a void lien and you've got this debt obligation which has no personal liability, it can only be enforced against the property, and you know that the lien is void, there's no opportunity to uh, reinstate it, arguably it could be a UDAP to f attempt to further collect on that debt. So this obviously is, is problematic. Um, somebody submitted a question which I think raises another really good point here. The question was, well, if you've got a CLTV which is greater than 80% and you cure by sending the notice acknowledging that the lien is only valid up to 80% CLTV, the question is, does that simply make the first 80% secured and anything above that unsecured but still a personal obligation of the borrower? Well, the answer is, is that you still have under the terms of the debt obligation itself, it says there's no personal liability or recourse for this debt. So if you are curing a CLTV violation by saying, well, the lien is only enforceable up to 80% CLTV, anything above that, well, it's not enforceable through the lien. There's no personal recourse against the borrower, so it doesn't seem to be enforceable. And that begs the question then, well, can you collect on it? And I think um, it's arguably, and I think I can certainly envision the CFPB taking this position, uh, the answer could be no. You can't collect on, on that extra, anything above that 80% CLDV, even though, you know, under Texas law, you know, when you look at what Garofalo said, it said you know, it, that a, a lien made, a loan that doesn't comply fully with case 6 is not necessarily invalid. It, doesn't, it technically doesn't invalidate the debt obligation. A, a lender could make home equity loans that are non-compliant. It's just they risk forfeiting uh, the enforceability of the lien they, the, oh, and or principal interest in appropriate circumstances. But, but you, risk, you could make a non-compliant home equity loan. It's tech, Supreme Court says, says, hey, but you might not be able to or you would not be able to enforce the lien if it's non-compliant. Well, the problem is, is that since most lenders are trying to comply with 50A6, they're going to put in that provision in the loan agreement that says no personal recourse, which means that once the lien is invalid, now it's not enforceable. And 
I think that's going to cause a lot of headaches to people going forward because now the question of, you know, one, having to look back all the way back to 1988 to f find violations, and two, now that Garofolo has introduced this concept that not all violations are curable, the question becomes, all right, well, do we have a violation that, void, and that, that confirms that the lien is void, and is it now one which is susceptible to cure? And Garofolo was considering an edge case where uh, – Obviously, the catch-all provision uh, didn't do much to correct the underlying violation because the violation was occurring because the lien had already been paid off and the uh, lender uh, allegedly had failed to uh, reasonably the lien and provide a, a confirmation of that within the required period of time. Uh, giving the borrower $1,000 and offering to refinance clearly doesn't do much to correct that violation when there's nothing to refinance anymore. That, that's a pretty edge case. But it seems possible that a court reading Garofalo broadly could say, well, if you've got some other type of violation that where none of the other cure provisions apply and that catch-all provision in F doesn't do anything to, quote, correct the underlying harm to the borrower, then that violation just might be inherently uncurable which means that there's no way to make the debt enforceable again. Uh, to give you some examples of types of violations where this risk conceivably could apply, um, for example, one of the provisions of the Constitution says that you can't make a home equity loan on the condition that the uh, consumer be required to apply the proceeds to any other debt except uh, other debt secured by the homestead or non-mortgage debt uh, paid to a different lender. So you can't require the borrower to pay the proceeds to non-mortgage debt held by the same lender. Well, if you have that, that violation and then the borrower was required to pay, pay proceeds in, the, in that manner, giving them $1,000 and refinancing that home equity loan arguably doesn't do anything to remediate that underlying harm because the proceeds have already been applied to pay off that prior debt. Um, the only way to really undo that harm, arguably, is to unwind that payoff, return the proceeds to the borrower, and allow the borrower to apply the proceeds however they want. But that's not a cure that is confident under any of the mechanisms of the Constitution. So Garofalo would say maybe that forfeiture is not a remedy for that, but if you look at Wood and Garofalo together, then you're looking at a situation where if that is really can't be cured, but there is this violation out there, the lien is void. Uh, other issues could be, you know, failure to provide disclosures in advance of co consummation, uh, giving that 12-day waiting period. If that 12-day waiting period wasn't observed, the borrower took out equity without being fully informed, you know, does refinancing really correct that underlying harm? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, failing to provide a three-day rescission period for the original loan. Uh, does refinancing cure that? Because you just the borrower is still is obligated on this home equity that they took out when they didn't have an opportunity to rescind that decision to take out that home equity. Um, I think it seems likely. It's hard to predict how courts are going to read this. I think that most violations ultimately are going to be found to be uh, curable because there is a body of case law out there now saying that uh, many, many of these violations are curable under the catch-all provision. Um, Garofalo doesn't change that necessarily. And Garofalo itself says that you know, it's undoubtedly in the vast majority of cases a violation is going to be curable under the catch-all provision. Uh, it's just there's this risk now that because Garofalo has introduced this new concept that maybe the catch-all isn't universal, if courts start reading that expansively and trying to help lenders by limiting the applicability of the forfeiture remedy, it could have the unintended consequence of meaning that you've got more and more home equity loans which are under their terms now unenforceable because there's no lien and there's no personal recourse. Uh, next slide. Uh, Deb, I will turn it back to you to talk about you know, future lit litigation implications and the types of causes of action that a borrower now could have in the event that there is a known violation of the Constitution. 
Okay, so David gave us a lot of practical considerations to think about here. You know, we have creative plaintiff's lawyers out there throughout the country, unfortunately, who will be looking to capitalize on these recent decisions. So, you know, first, which was breach of contract, specifically discussed in some of these cases, you know, in Wood, the borrowers had not appealed that portion, but in Garofolo, they certainly did. And, you know, the court went out of its way a couple of times to say, look, you know, if, you, if this plaintiff could have proven actual damages or brought a claim for specific performance, the outcome of their breach of contract claim would have been different here. So if the borrower in that instance was able to prove, for example, that by failing to receive the recordable lien, um, you know, X, Y, or Z happened to them, and as a result they were damaged in a specific amount, they would have a breach of contract claim there. So you can think of many ways that creative plaintiff's lawyers could think about breach of contract claims in these instances, especially given the, the incorporation of the Texas Constitution into these loan agreements. You also can think about fraud types of, of causes of action. You know, the borrowers will say they were allegedly defrauded all these years. The, the monthly loan statements, for example, sent to me showed that I owed this percentage on my loan over the years, but that was in violation of the Texas Constitution. As a result, I now have a fraud claim. You know, Wood did not reach the fraud claim because that was not one that the borrowers appealed there, but you could certainly see that coming up in, the, in a litigation context. David outlined some of the issues from an unfair and deceptive trade practices type of cause of action. And that is certainly an issue that plaintiff's lawyers have pushed. You know, when they bring claims under home equity lines of credit or whether it's a loan agreement, just your, your regular mortgage, they always throw in the kitchen sink breach of contract, unfair deceptive trade practices. And then, of course, the, the concept of wrongful foreclosure, which ties it most specifically back to 50A in the Constitution, you can't try to force the sale of my home because you violated these provisions of the Texas Constitution. And a lot of times we see those in counterclaims and foreclosure actions, and it, it leads to the next slide as well. We've seen an increase in counterclaims um, in foreclosure that attempt to bring class actions, which of course is a whole different, a whole different pain of, of potential liability there. So the class action lawyers can think about alleged noncompliance on a large scale. So if there's a particular policy that uh, the lenders failed to, as a, a uniform matter, provide releases of lien and recordable forms to borrowers, you could see how plaintiff's class action lawyers might bring a claim on that basis. And now you have the risk of not having the statute of limitations cut off liability if the, the lien is purportedly void. So thinking about the cause, oh, go ahead, David. No, no, sorry, I just clear my throat. Okay, so on these, you could see that within class action context, you know, breach of contract claims are typically pretty hard to prove on a class basis because you have many different forms of contracts over the years, but certainly plaintiff's lawyers may try to bring those claims or fraud and deceptive trade practices claims we've seen. We had one on, under different circumstances out uh, in a different jurisdiction, but analogous types of arguments about the fact that, you know, we had these monthly mortgage statements. They didn't show clearly that um, this fee was allegedly uh, not a valid fee, and as a result, we can bring a class claim on this basis. And you could see here where they might say, this fee, the loan balance, many different things here were allegedly misrepresented on my, my statements. So defenses here, I think we'd have very powerful defenses that individual issues to a class claim would predominate. You'd really have to, at least we would argue, look at this on a loan by loan basis to determine whether there is a constitutional violation. You'd have to look at someone's loan terms. You'd also have to look at, you know, did the folks provide notice and the 60-day um, cure provision, so you'd have to take a look at that to see whether the borrower complied with that. Um, so the lien may not be void and the statute of limitations could apply depending upon whether there was a constitutional violation or not. And practical considerations going forward, and, and David, you know, feel free to jump in here. You've talked about some of these previously, but, you know, 
in terms of folks lending and using Texas home equity loans, you may see an increase in cure letters from borrowers and their attorneys after these two decisions have come out. You may see, you know, lots of letters coming in saying you violated this provision of the Texas Constitution and um, we'd like you to remedy it. So it's important to think about how you would respond to such an influx in cure letters from the borrowers. Do you have procedures or special teams lined up to review and correct those if necessary following notice? These decisions um, also, oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention here with respect to the cure provisions is that um, obviously responding to, cure, to notices of violation and curing within the cure period once you receive a notice becomes very important now because that's the only way to validate the lien, to create an enforceable lien and, and create an enforceable loan obligation, assuming that there is no personal recourse under the debt. Um, luckily, the Texas regulations, uh, the Finance Commission has put out regulations uh, interpreting 50A6 that you know, go into quite a bit of detail about how the cure provisions work and you know, how a lender may establish uh, an address to which the borrower may send a notice of violation and how you measure the 60 days. And then it goes into quite a bit of detail, which uh, resolves a lot of the ambiguities. Um, one thing in particular to note here is that what those regulations say is that at origination, uh, the lender may establish a particular address uh, to which the borrower is going to be required to send uh, notice of a uh, of a violation that would start that 60-day cure period. Uh, that address subsequently can be changed by the lender or any subsequent holder by sending clear and conspicuous uh, notice to the to the homeowner, notifying them of the new address. Uh, the regulations also say, though, that regardless of whether or not a specific address has been established, the homeowner always has the option of sending notice to the registered agent of the lender or holder. Uh, so it's important to, one, figure out whether or not an address has been established. Uh, if one has been established, making sure that you're comfortable with that address, uh, recognizing that notices might not be sent exclusively to that address, but also to the registered agent and then having procedures in place to you know, make sure that you're capturing those notices as they come in and tracking the timelines to make sure that you are, uh, if there is a legitimate issue, curing it within that, those next 60 days. Uh, one client uh, recently raised an interesting question, which we're still looking into, which is if you've got a situation where the original lender did not specify a particular address, uh, can the an assignee or the subsequent servicer, you know, establish an address by sending notice to the consumer of the uh, of an address. Uh, you know, as a policy reason, I don't see any reason why not. But you know, the way the regulations are worded, uh, it says that a holder, uh, subsequent holder, can change the address by sending notice. It sort of assumes that an address was established in the first place. We're still looking into the question about whether or not, you know, there's ability to set a new address by a subsequent assignee or servicer. Um, but that it may end up being just a, a gray area. In any event, you know, pay attention to the regulations, take a look, and, and make sure that you've got procedures in place to, to cure within the cure period once you get those notices. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, sure, and just to add on to what David said, I could see from a case law perspective that courts potentially could look to the RESPA area to qualified written requests and you know, lenders who have established addresses uh, to which borrowers should send qualified written requests. There's been a lot of changes in the courts throughout the country on this. And, um, you know, even language surrounding where the borrower should send this uh, cure letter will be very important. If you're using a must send the cure letter to this address, or you may send the cure letter to this address, courts have viewed those very differently must establishing a sole address um, at which to receive the request versus you may, the borrowers may send the request to an address allows more ambiguity and to the extent a borrower sends it elsewhere, courts have found, you know, you haven't established an exclusive address. So for this provision in Texas, think very carefully about even the language you use associated with your, your address to which these folks should send the care letters. 
So moving on, just a few other practical considerations. We've got just a few more minutes left this morning. Um, think about your complete and accurate records on home equity loans and how long you should retain the, um, the packages for home equity closing closings, as well as you know how long after payoff you should retain the documents. So those are going to be important considerations to you moving forward there. Uh, David, did you have anything you wanted to say on that point? No. Okay. Then we'll go on to our next slide here. Think about um, extra steps in your foreclosure review process. You might want to, I'm sure folks are taking a look at whether the loan meets the Texas constitutional requirements before proceeding, but now maybe you have another team in place, someone with uh, expertise specifically on these provisions and uh, take a look to see whether these loans meet the requirements. If not, what can you do to cure it so that you start the statute of limitations and you're proceeding on a valid lien? So think about whether you want to do this, even with now out notice from borrowers. I think that probably depends on the, uh, the volume you have in Texas of home equity loans. And uh, you see whether the proper cure will validate the lien that may have otherwise violated the Texas Constitution at origination. One other thought here is we know that Texas has a quasi-judicial process for foreclosure. You may consider you want to file a full action and have a Texas court bless what you're doing before proceeding on that. And then lastly here, do we want to do a preemptive review of our home, home equity loan portfolio? Do you want to focus on the non-performing loans because those might be the loans that would get to foreclosure sooner than others? Do you want to go as far as looking at performing loans? And do you have a systematic way to analyze some of these provisions within your loan agreements? So if there is um, some query you can run to see what the uh, you know, rates are, what the amounts are, the CLTV, you know, do you want to run some queries to see whether there are things that you should be addressing? And, Finally, you want to consider the impact on, on home equity lending in Texas and do a cost-benefit analysis to your business and, and whether this is something that is, is important to you, whether it makes sense um, financially, and uh, go forward from there about whether, how much home equity lending you want to do in the future. So, David, did you have anything to add there? Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the, the preemptive review of the portfolio is that, you know, there's an inherent tension between you know, wanting to identify to identify your risks and figure out whether there are violations where uh, you can cure and validate the lien and then proceed to to enforce, versus you know, being willfully blind is always is never a good thing. But you know, once you know that a violation exists, then you've got to do something about it. And now that you've got this. In uncertainty under Garofolo about you know whether or not a uh, given violation is or is not curable. It you've got this tension now where you, let's say that you identify a violation. You know, in order to mitigate the, the UDAP risk, you want to you have an interest in, in curing it to make sure that there is you've got an argument that there is a valid lien. So you'd want to reach out to the borrower and make a, a cure offer that happens to be under the catch-all, it would be um, set, refunding $1,000 and offering to, to refinance on terms which comply with 50A6, so which the parties agree comply with 50A6. But if you've got uh, this uncertainty about whether or not the, the, the cure is even going to be effective or not, now you've you know, put the, not the borrower on notice that this issue exists, which could imp impede your ability to foreclose or increase the likelihood of litigation down the road. So it, it really puts people in, in a difficult position because, one, you want to do right by consumers, two, you want to mitigate your risks, but you know, there are the, the risks to some extent cut against each other because you know, by, by solving for one problem, you may inadvertently create issues for uh, under, you know, these other theories. So it is what it is, I guess. 
Okay, well, we're just a, a minute or two before the end of the hour here, and I don't think we're going to have time to address the questions we have. We will try to get back to those of you who have uh, put questions forth uh, for us. We really appreciate that. We appreciate you joining today's call. We hope the information that we've shared today was useful. And as mentioned before, should you have any questions that you've not already posed, please go ahead and email them to Pascal Rucker at P as in Paul Rucker, R-U-C-K-E-R -E at mayorbrown.com and she'll forward the questions to us. So thank you very much. We hope you have a 